Um, Ken's going to dispel some myths, maybe, um, or maybe put some more questions and conversation into the to the uh, thought here. Uh, Ken's going to talk about how the 53 Corvette was actually developed, generated, delivered, where it was built, where the first few of them were built. Not every one of them was built where you think they were built. Three parts here. It'll take about two and a half to three hours to do this. We will have breaks. Okay, thanks, Jim. I did this presentation in an abbreviated form at the National. And I did, that's the first time I did it. And I did it to get some feedback, and the feedback I got let me improve it and expand upon it. This is basically the outline for a book that I'm doing. And there's, there's a lot of photos in it, but I don't feel there's enough photos for a book, and I have a meeting set up to go down to the Heritage Center and try to find more, more photos. Now that we know what the photos might, might tell us, we'll know where to put them in the book. Okay, this is the photo that we've all been told is the first Corvettes rolling off the line, June 30th, 1953 in Flint, with Tony Kleiber, the UAW person behind the wheel, R.G. Ford, the Chevrolet Assembly Plants Manager, that's for all Chevrolet plants countrywide, and Frank J. Fezenden, who was the plant manager there at the time. There's a thing called the proverbial Corvette bug, and when you're bitten by the bug, you all know the feeling. This was mine. This was Sports Illustrated, 1966. Steve McQueen driving a brand new 427 heavy duty, heavy suspension car. Reading this magazine in high school in the library is where I got bit by the Corvette bug in 1966. Why is that important? Well, in July of 1967, my dad drove me up to Flint, Michigan from Buffalo, New York to see GMI. And on the way into town, he went past this building and he told me, that's where the Corvettes are built. And I said, can we stop and go in? And he said, no, they're closed for shutdown. So you can imagine how disappointed I was. This is the back part of the plant, since been tore down. That is a ramp to the roof. This fic I took this picture with the 53 Corvettes that were there in 1003 for the 50th. That's GMI. GMI began in 1919. Between 1919 and 1953, literally hundreds of graduates were positioned throughout General Motors Corporation, pretty much running GM. When I got there, there was a legend. And that legend said, Plant 35, next door to GMI, is where the first two Corvettes were built. That has been a legend since 53. It's still a legend today. I heard it then, and I didn't know what it meant. This is Carl Ludwigson's book. And I have corresponded over the years with Carl. He's in England. He's writing another interesting book, but this was really the first book that delved into the history of the Corvette, and he published it in 1973. And I spoke to him about a month before I put the presentation together for the National. You'll see a little bit about that as we go forward. Specifically in his book on page 33, he says, quote, the first 300 were built close to the home of Chevrolet on one floor of the division's plant number 35. Isn't that interesting? That's exactly what the legend at GMI says. I asked him about this. I said, I realize it's 40 years ago when you wrote the book, Kyle, but do you have any notes and do you remember anything about this? He says, I'll tell you what my research was. I did all my research at the GM Tech Center in Detroit and the vast majority of it was on the General Motors side of the tracks, not the Chevrolet side of the tracks. Most of it was at styling. And he also, I also said, Carl, this is so specific, you can't make this up. Somebody had to tell you that. Now, why is that important? What does one floor of something tell you? It tells you there's more than one, or else you wouldn't even mention it, right? He also says that 14 cars were turned out in St. Louis in December of 1953. Well, this is 
how Chevrolet Motor Company of Michigan looked in July of 1918. What you're looking at there from the upper left corner and swirling down to the right there in kind of an S, that's the Flint River. And there's a building on the north side of it, and there's a couple buildings down here on the south side of it. And that's all of Chevrolet Motor Division in 1918. This is a street view of it. The one that's on the north side of the river's plant too, that was originally built by the little car company that made the little car, because that was the owner's name, Little. That was acquired by Billy Durant. On the south side of the river, and where the dotted line is, is where the original Mason Motor Car Company was. He also acquired that. Where the other dotted area is, no longer there in 1918, is the original Flint Wagon Works. So this was the hub of the carriage industry in Flint that then started building cars. You see where the question mark is up in the left-hand corner? Anybody familiar with Flint know what's being built? Right here, 1918, where that question mark is? GMI is being built. It opened in 1919. That's the location. Here it is, 1929, 10 years later. You'll notice GMI is up there, prominent on the top. Building 2A is Fisher Body. That's where the sit-down strike emanated from. Fisher built the bodies, sent them on an overhead trestle across the street to Building 2 where Chevrolet assembled them. That's where the big neon Chevrolet sign was that's out on Owen Road at a Chevrolet dealer now. So it didn't get hit by the wrecking ball. Building 5 is new. Some of the other buildings are new, but I want to call your attention to building number 1. <coughs> 1927. That is Chevrolet headquarters. That's what Kyle's referring to when he says it's the home of Chevrolet. That is Chevrolet Central Office, building number one. There's a big parking lot across the street. Right behind it is building three. That's Chevrolet Experimental. That's where the first Corvette was built for the Motorama. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves there. This is 1941. You'll see plant 35 when taking up part of the parking lot. That was the last plant built in Flint prior to World War II. There wouldn't be another Chevrolet plant built in Flint until 1968. That's a pretty long drought. But that's plant 35. <laughs> Here's an aerial view of it. GMI is down here. We're looking southeast. GMI is down here in the corner. When I got there in 67, they were building the campus center and the dorms near the center. There's building one, upper right, or I'm sorry, upper left. Three-story building. That is Chevrolet headquarters. The only headquarters, the only office building Chevrolet has. South of it is building two, the main assembly building. Fisher bodies to the right, 2A, and up in the upper left, where that 3 is, that is Chevrolet Experimental. It's a four-story building. The first floor is a machine shop, and above it is all special projects. Everything Chevrolet did special was right there, out the back door where all the executives sat in building number one. Here's a little, little closer view. In this view, you'll see two cars on the roof of this building in the foreground. It looks to be a white Corvette convertible and a station wagon. Because that's the new customer delivery garage. Those two towers are elevators. And they would take, if you bought a car, FOB zero, zero dollars and wanted to take delivery with zero transportation charges, you could do it right here in this two-story building. Not a one-story building, two. And that's what somebody's doing. Okay, so how did I get into all this mess? Well, I was working as an engineer for Chevrolet and I ordered a brand new 75 Corvette convertible, knowing it was the last year. I had confirmation it was built in 1974. It was the first one built for the Tonawanda complex. So I sold my 74 the first day it was in the paper only to find out they canceled all the, all the company orders without telling anybody and waited till December 1st to tell us. So I was without a Corvette, so I bought a 57 Corvette out of California, Culver City, 
And after I bought that car, he joined the NCRS in my number 650. Well, as soon as I bought that car, I come into the plant after about a week and rumors going around that I bought this old Corvette and a guy by the name of Willard G. Byer, who was the master mechanic, stopped me and Bill was a guy that was known for just incredibly tall BS stories. And he said to me, I heard you bought an old Corvette with the shark's teeth grill. And I said, yes, I did, Bill. And he said to me, I got your intake and exhaust set up. And I think to myself, how in the heck can he have, he doesn't even know what I need, much less how could he have it. So, you know, I thought about that for a while. I went back about a week later and I asked him more about it. And Bill told me he was the Tonawanda Engine Plant's engineering liaison to the Corvette plant in Flint in 1953. His job was to fix any and all L6 issues on any car that was trying to be driven out of that plant. He got a company car given to him. He had to come up to the, from Buffalo to Flint every Sunday night, be in the plant Monday through half a day Friday. And every trip he brought as many parts as engine parts as he could fit in the trunk, except one time he stopped at his house first and he dropped off a brand new intake right through the carburetors, exhaust, everything, fuel lines. You're going to see it here in a minute. <coughs> so I went over to his house and he flabbergasted me and uh, I bought it for 250 bucks. It was a real steal, but that's what he wanted for it. And he said to me, you know, they faked the roll-off of those first two Corvettes. And he just about knocked me over. Because <clears throat> I knew he was a storyteller. Well, there it is on my picnic table. And there's all my notes from up on top. And those brass tags are stamped E37, which is May 7th, 1953. So I bought it, and here's an interesting, curious little thing, is that little rib on the exhaust manifold was only on about the first 20 engines. Some of the 53 guys that know them, like the back of their hand will tell you that. So that also verified it as being very early. When I got the money together and I picked it up, Bill told me a little more. He said, I was there. I saw it, meaning the fakery. He says, I knew it. But he says, no one except management ever knew it. Well, I had no reason not to believe Bill. I mean, he had, you know, he was there and he had this intake and exhaust manifold. Then he also really blew me away when he said he worked on a 261 cubic inch L6 racing engine project for Henry DuPont's Corvette. And he said it had special heads at a much higher compression ratio. Shortly thereafter, Bill was killed in a, in a car accident when the police were chasing a drug addict and he was doing 130 miles an hour and T-boned him. Uh, very, un very unfortunate. <laughs> well, I put this information away in my mind until Nolan Adams came to town in 2003. He came five years before that. We booked all the hotels. We set everything up. We really thought the NCRS and GM would come back to Flint for the 50th and they shunned us. But the Silent Action Club and Nolan and myself, we pushed on. And he got into town on Tuesday, June 24th, and he called me and he said, what are you doing tonight? I said, well, I got plans tonight, why? He goes, well, Carl Jerema, the Corvette engineer, is hosting us at his house tonight. And he said, there's gonna be four 1953 Corvette workers there. And I said, hey, you don't have to say anymore. My plans just changed. So we went over to Carl's and his wife had nice, uh, you know, cookies and coffee and all kinds of stuff brewing. And he told us about his 53 Corvette experience. His wife kept a scrapbook second to none that was on a dining room table. And just like myself and everybody else, you know, during the day at the plant, you put parts in your pockets and you forget to take them out. He had 53 nose emblems, horn buttons, you name it, that he always took home and forgot to take back. And I don't mean deliberately forget to take back, I mean you just forget. Well, he had all that stuff on the table. And all four guys were given these beautiful red embroidered shirts with their name on it, and 53 Corvette, uh, you know, 
a car builder, and they had hats. So the second guy was George McGriff, and I was like talking to George, he told me that at one time he owned the 1053 Corvette, and he told us about how the one-piece floor pan didn't work, and it was his idea, according to him, to cut that pan and shiplap it and make it whatever it needed to be so they could build the rest of the car. So that was interesting. Well, the third expert already had a memory loss. He couldn't remember a thing. He was just happy to be there, but uh, nice guy, but of, of little information as far as historical purposes. So then there was, uh, and Joe Bentoski was ill, and he didn't attend all week. So the last guy to talk to was a guy by the name of Bob Wilson, a very quiet guy. And I had talked to the other guys, and then his wife, Carl's wife, invited us in the kitchen to get something to eat. So as we're doing that, I saw Bob Wilson head back in to scope out the dining room table. So I followed him, and I said, hi, how are you? And uh, he was a very reserved guy. So I said to him, I said, hey, Bob, what was your experience with a 53 Corvette? And again, you could have floored me. His answer was none. So wait a minute, hold it, time out. You got the red shirt, says you were there, you're the expert, now you're telling me. Well, then he explained it. I was there when we built the first two top secret Corvettes. He said the first one we built, we finished in the last quarter of 52, and the second one we finished in the first quarter of 53, and I was transferred out of that plant in May before the cars were started. Well, Nolan Adams is out in the kitchen. Imagine that. Didn't hear this. So I said, well, hold on, Bob, Bob, come here. I'm grabbing Bob's arm. Let's go. Come on. So we look up Nolan. I said, Bob, tell Nolan what you just told me. And he did. And you know what Nolan did? I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> we were shattering Nolan's paradigm. He didn't want to know. And I can, I can, I can. A week later, I got a hold of Joe Bentoski. Turned out he only lived two blocks from me, as it turned out. So I made an appointment to go see him in his living room. And I said, what can you tell me about the roll-off? That's what he said. I was in the locker room getting changed for the 6 a.m. start when our boss came in and said, hey, don't change your clothes. Go over to the other side of the building and get your picture taken with the Corvettes. So we never saw those cars before. They were brought in overnight. They weren't made there. He was putting the plant together. And the guys putting the equipment in had no idea what the, it was going to make. So this was all news to him. So this is the official picture now of the first Corvette. And there's Joe. Third from the left, and there's a guy next to him by the name of George. We're going to come back to George in a little bit and find out who George really is. But this is what we were told. So, there's a lot of Corvette legends, myths. Harley Earl designed the Corvette, true or false. Public demand caused the Corvette's production, true or false. The first tool rolled off the line, June 30th, maybe. The first Corvette would not start. There were no ground wires. Everybody's heard that one. The first Corvette's leaked, so we drilled holes in the floor. <laughs> they had Bel Air hubcaps because the Corvette's hubcaps were late. The 53 Waldorf Corvette has survived to this day. Or so we're told. <laughs> Where did the 53 Motorama and the second show Corvette really go? Who was W.S. Wolfram? How did Chevy roll the Corvette off the line in only five months after being introduced? Why was the Opal code name? Who was Paramount Engineering? And who is the real father of the Corvette? How were Chevrolet's Plant 35 involved? How many 53 Corvettes did Van Slyke build? Zero? Here's some numbers for you. Zero, 50, 298, 300, 315. They've all been reported. Which is it? All 53 Corvettes were white. True or false? All 53 Corvettes had L6 engines. Maybe. Why are all the Corvettes never shown with the top up? And the outside guy, why 50 mirrors were all so late, supposedly? Well, 
Where is the genesis of the Corvette? You can go back to 1951 when Harley Earl debuted the Buick LeSabre at the GM Proving Ground. The designer was Henry uh, DeLauve up there in the upper left-hand corner. They named it the LeSabre because in French that means the sword. GM spent $3.7 million in the day. Imagine what that would cost today to build the LeSabre to demonstrate a partnership between styling and GM's research advanced technologies. Well, first place he took it was Watkins Glen in September. It was a hell of a crowd pleaser. It stopped, it just, people just mad, masked around it. But everybody who raced sports cars told Earl it was too big, he'll never be able to race. But see, he didn't build it to race. He built it for himself because he was six foot four. But he did learn a lesson and he started thinking smaller. He and Harlow Curtis, who at the time was the executive in charge of all the car divisions in North America, he was executive vice president, good friends with Harley Earl. They decided that GM needed a two seat sports car and they began the full size artist design process. The people that did that were Harley himself, Joe Shemansky, and Bob McLean. Then there was another designer by, by the name of Carl Renner. Carl didn't design whole cars. He designed fancy stuff, fancy taillights, fancy grills, fancy aerials, fancy mirrors, and then let all the other guys take their, his elements and put them in. Carl Curtis and Harley Earl met with Tom Keating, who was a Chevrolet general manager, to talk about a sports car. They wanted to get it to the market for $1,850, the same price as a, as a Chevrolet was. Now, why did these two guys, the head of styling and the head of GM overall, the man under the president of the company, pick Chevrolet? Well, the answer was Chevrolet sales were plummeting while the rest of the industry was going like a rocket. Chevy was losing 200,000 cars year to year from 1950 to 1953. It had a horrible reputation and no performance in an old person's car. And they wanted to change it, and this is how they decided to change it. So Keating agreed, of course those were his two higher level executives, he's gonna pretty much nod his head. He agreed, so that means now we gotta put some Chevrolet designers in with the team as well, and those guys were Vincent Captor, Carl Peebles, Bill Block, and Tony Balthazar. They, in April of 52, they unveiled this clay model in the GM Styling Auditorium, which was next to the GM building in Detroit. It's not the auditorium up in Warren that you see today. And Ed Cole, who was chief engineer of Cadillac, was invited to that showing. Actually, he really wasn't told what he was doing there, but when he walked in, the curtain opened, and there's the car. But there was some reason behind that. They needed Cole, uh, Harley Earl, and Curtis knew they needed somebody to kick Chevrolet in the butt. So they wanted Cole, but there's no reason for Cole to leave Cadillac where he's an up and coming star. So they had to dangle something in front of him. And they said, we want you to be chief engineer of this. They knew they needed him because there was a, there was a, Maurice Ollie was the Cadillac chassis designer. He was the preeminent chassis designer in all of North America, and he wouldn't leave Cadillac unless to Cole told him to come over too. And they said, this is gonna be Col Project Opal, and oh, by the way, we're doing a V8 ad, and we really need you, and you got about 10 minutes to decide. Well, he decided. May 1st, he became the chief engineer of Chevrolet. He brought Maurice Ali with him, and Harry Barr, who was already there, became the assistant chief engineer of Chevrolet. And Ali sketched this wheelbase, 102 inch wheelbase, from which to build on. And May 1st, the 52 Project Opal was a go project for specifically Chevrolet. GM styling. Initially said they'll make the one-piece molded fiberglass bodies and we're going to make five of them, four for Chevrolet and one for Fisher body. That changes in a little bit as you'll see. Chevrolet, you engineer five chassis. You also do five engines and transmissions and you buy five sets of every single component we need to finish the car. So five cars were approved 
Four for Chevy, one for Fisher Body. Well, we just Corvette just passed 60 years old, so it's time we really find out what really happened after this. And here's the 53 that debuted in January, 53, on the turntable. That's Ed Cole next to it with his boss, Tom Keating. This is a, a photo that GM took prior to the prior to the masses of public coming in. Now, to understand this, you have to understand Chevrolet's work order system. They track every single penny ever spent on anything. And they did it with a work order system. And they, the next work order they picked was 17,000. And they picked that right after World War II to develop a brand new 1950 Chevy passenger car. And that car was going to run for seven years. But you know, you got to be, before you even bring the car out in year one, you're, gonna, you're planning changes for year two, more changes for year three, more changes for year four. You got to keep all your costs right. So 17,100, all the costs for the 51 Chevy were booked against it. 200 was 52, and then you can see how that goes. That's how they kept track of their money. But then they also wanted to keep track of sub-elements under the bigger ones. So for example, 17,696 was the program for developing the Chevrolet V8s. 697 was specific for capturing every penny that it cost to put fuel injection on the Corvette in 57. When it came to racing, 17,710 was the racing bucket that all the money was, was put into for the 1956 racing program and 17,790. So you can see the kind of numbering system they were dealing with. But they also wanted to do a truck. And they didn't know when they'd have enough money to finish it so they made it a 19.5X. We don't know, but that's the next number, 18,000. And of course, they keep track of costs like that. Now here comes the Corvette. What's the next number? 19,000. So to keep track of every penny Chevy spent on a Corvette, they hit put 19,000 in. And then 19,001 was to capture the cost for the Opal body construction. 19,002 was to capture the cost for the very first Opal test car. That's Chevrolet number there, 852. And that was going to be a design check car. 19,003 was for 853, which was a demonstrator. The third car built was the one that was going to go to Fisher Body, so that was nicknamed the F car. Captured cost on 19,004. 1915 was uh, the 854, which was the first engineering test car, and the second engin engineering test car was 1855. Those were the buckets I captured the money in. And then the Corvette was going to go on year after year after year, so it followed the same pattern. 19,100 was for the 54s, and right on through 19,900, which would capture costs all the way up to the 62. Pretty straightforward but it helps to know the numbers and you're going to see why. Okay, so here's the Opal build plan. 852, the work order, what it's called, where they're building it, Chevrolet Experimental, plant number three, right in downtown Flint, right behind Chevrolet headquarters. That's where the cars are going to be built. Here's an actual piece of paper that I found right out of Chevrolet Engineering dated November 14, 1952 except something's wrong. There's a car missing. There isn't five cars anymore. There's only three Opal test cars at Chevrolet, starting with 19,003, car 853. Where did 852 go? It's gone. It's only November 14th and it's gone. We don't know where it went. But this entire document is going to be closed out on May 22nd, 1953. Kind of a curious date. Now here's another one, November 25th. Cars 854 and 855, there are lines through them. And here's another curious date. This thing is closed out on June 29th, 1953. Well, it turns out, on November 25th, they weren't crossed out yet. They get crossed out a little while later, but before this piece of paper got filed, and before it got stamped on June 29th, it was closed, somebody just for whatever purposes put two lines to it because it, do, it does happen it's just not happening yet on the 25th of november so here's a new opal show opal build plan what happened to the first car 
Harley Earl said, hey Chevrolet, I need a car for the motorama. I'm going to take your Corvette and you aren't going to stop me. And that's literally what he did. He just took it from me. It was gone. Thank you very much. Soldier on. So the best plan is one that's flexible to change with a changing situation. Another piece of paper, December 5th. It clearly says what I just told you. Don't have to take my word for it. Here's the documentation right on Chevrolet. And it goes, it is written right to Ed Cole by E.J. Primo, who is the chief engineer for all bodies in Chevrolet. It says right there, 852 is the Waldorf show car. Completion date, when is it finished? Just like Bob Wilson said, fourth quarter of 1952 on December 22nd. When did Bob Wilson say the second car was going to be done? First quarter of 53. It was actually done February 1st, 1953. But there's some other changes. Uh, the Fisher test car, that's going to be reassigned. Okay, there's, there's a change going on here that isn't quite clear in this letter yet, but it'll be clear in the next couple. And then 854 is scheduled to be done. That's a scheduled date, April 22nd, and 8, 855 is April 29th. Now, wait a minute, if you're Chevy Engineering, and your first two test cars aren't going to be done at the end of April, and you expect to build cars at the end of June, it doesn't give you a whole lot of time to test the cars and make any fixes, does it? Well, guess what? Chevrolet realized that too. There's no point in even finishing these cars. Okay, here's December 5th. No purchase, says, quote, no purchase orders required to buy a body from Fisher Body for car 853. That's the second Motorama car. There's been a deal worked out. Corporation's not building the, fish, the, the plastic bodies. Fisher is actually going to build the five plastic bodies. Who was W.S. Wolfram and who was Paramount Engineering? Well, W.S. Wolfram was the project Opal manager. He was the only person in Chevrolet assigned to work on the, on the Corvette. Imagine that. One executive is the only person working in Chevrolet on the Corvette. That's because all the work was contracted to an engineering firm in Detroit, Paramount Engineering, who was the contract source, so he literally managed the contractors. That's because Chevrolet only had 600 engineers in 1951, 52, 53. That's it, 600. And those 600 had to take care of the cars and the trucks. So they outsourced it. But they did use, the outsourcing source did use the experimental O dash numbers. They took a block of a thousand numbers, set them aside for Paramount. All the work was done off site. The word Opal was a German subsidiary, so it was perfect security, and security was never breached. Nobody outside, a handful of people, ever found out this project was going on. Luckily, some things survived, including this blueprint for experimental part 117, 170, which is the crankcase front. It's the actual engine block for the 53 Corvette. And you see the little opal football on the left. There's another one with the little opal football. This is the water pump rotor for the water pump in the 53 Corvette. And that's its part number. And all the changes are recorded in the upper right-hand corner. And they're all booked to work order 19,000. It's hard to read down there in the title, but 19000, that big master number, is plastered over 1,000 blueprints. Every single part that was specific for the Corvette has that in it. Now, why did these drawings survive in the Chevrolet system? Because I personally pulled the aperture cards and ran these about 25 years ago. Well, the little opal was there when it was drawn. But then when they gave the drawings to Chevrolet, they took Chevrolet blueprint paper and they cut the Chevrolet motor division out and they scotch taped it over the top of the opal. And you know what happens to scotch tape over time? It dries out and falls off. So years later, when they ran it through the microfilm machine, it was peeling the Chevrolet name off and leaving the Opal one behind. <laughs> just, just so it happens. And here is the timing diagram 
Now, see, this has already been changed, and there's a Chevrolet that's been added. It's been taped on. It's the drawing right from Paramount Engineering. And all they did was tape the part number over the O-dash number and tape the Chevrolet Engineering on the left-hand side and call it the same drawing. But the Corvette, people say, you know, the Corvette didn't have any performance in 1953. Well, it actually did. It had the highest lift camshaft in the entire industry. Had that going for it. This is an unbelievable document I located. This is the master plan for Opal Build. It's dated December 22nd, 1952. It clearly states on this, I know it's hard to read in this wall, but 852 is the Waldorf show car, completed uh, 1222. This is my note. It has the first of five hand laid up bodies over the mahogany mold. And the records show that it only had it had so much resin in it that it would only stretch one half of one percent before it would break. So imagine walking up to your Corvette today, you're leaning on a panel, you know how it moves without breaking? Well, that's because they finally figured out how to put the right amount of resin in, but this thing was so bloody hard that it just broke. And they knew it. So here's, here's where we are. Uh, the first one's complete, and that's styling. The second car is at, at uh, Actually, the second car was going to be built. They started to build a Chevy Experimental, that building that was behind number one, and you know what happened? There was too many prying eyes. It was the second one, so now people were watching it. So to put it out of sight, they moved it over to the Flint Corvette plant, and that's the car that uh, Bob Wilson saw, the, one of the secret cars he saw going together. That's actually the first secret car he saw going together. <coughs> This piece of paper is again from Primo to Cole, and it says that uh, the third car, now this is where the switcheroo gets worked out, because Chevrolet saying, hey, wait a minute, you took away the first two cars and the next one goes to Fisher, and yet we're the customer. So they said, okay, Fisher, you wait for the fourth car, Chevy, you can pull the, their car ahead for you and it becomes the third car. But here's what they did, Chevy said there's not enough cars either. So they made an extra car and they called it number 856 and they built it first out of sequence. That's what it basically says there. And that car is pulled so far ahead, it's going to be finished on January 15th. It's literally the third car started, but it's going to be a second car finished. And this letter is written by Primo to Cole, because again, he's the assistant chief engineer. That's his picture. So here's where we're at well, with the status update. And John Dolza was well known to Curtis, Harley Earl, and Charlie Chain, and they recognized right away that the body was too stiff. They saw that right when it was at styling, so they asked John Dolza to get involved and start adjusting and figuring out what the fiberglass to resin ratio would be, and he started changing that a little more, changed the recipe to each one of the five cars that were, that were built. January 3rd, 1953, EX53, work order, 19,003. Okay, so there were four cars planned, then it dropped back to two, and now we know it's back up to three, and 856 changed places with the Fisher car. So that is that update. And because, because the Fisher project's being delayed, obviously, Fisher can't build their car where they thought they were gonna build it. Then an inter interesting thing happens. Eisenhower got elected in November. There was a little problem. I mean, the government had a little problem. They were $10 billion in secret debt building, in, building military plants all over the country next door to GM plants that supplied the military during the war. Truman vowed he would never get caught with the pants down. He would never allow us to have to change over the auto industry, which happened under duress. They didn't go, go voluntarily. It took an act of Congress to do it. So he, he was secretly building $10 million worth of plants and equipment around the country. That's why he got us into Korea. Eisenhower said, hey, I'm going to shut the war down 30 days after you elect me. He got elected, and then he got told, oh, by the way, there's this little 10 million, I'm sorry, 10 billion, did I say million? $10 billion problem that the military has. So, he, so the guy that was running the Republican Party at the time was a guy by the name of Summerfield that owned the largest Chevrolet dealership in the world right in Flint. He was the Republican National Chairman. He got Eisenhower elected. He said, Ike, 
You gotta make Charlie Wilson the president of General Motors your secretary of defense. He's the only guy that can figure this out. So they approached him, he said, okay. Okay, well, there was this brand new freshman senator during the Senate confirmation hearings. He was from Texas, I won't say his name, but his initials were LBJ. And he grilled them because Wilson had two and a half million dollars in GM stock. And he put it in a blind trust. But LBJ said, hey, let's not kid each other here. We all know you got it. And you might not be managing it. You might have a manager, but I don't trust you to do what's good for the country if it isn't good for GM. And that's where the famous statement came from on the congressional record. I've always had that problem running General Motors, but I've always found that what's good for the USA is good for General Motors. And the pre you think the press is bad today, turning things around, misquoting people? They deliberately turned it backwards when they misquoted them. That's where it comes from, and it's right in the congressional record. So he was going through the hearings at the same time all this is going on. Curtain opens on the Motorama, though, the same day, January 16, 1953. There's the article from the Flint Journal, actually dated January 16th. Motorama tops all previous shows. Curtain goes up and Chevrolet shows a new sports car and triple carbs and dual exhaust. And down in the bottom corner is a painting of the 53 Corvette that on the same day was given to every, one was given to every single Chevrolet plant in the country to hang in their lobby. And I didn't know the origin of that, but about 10 years ago, a guy showed up with one at Kettering University, the old GMI. He wanted to donate it, and I'm still working on him to donate it now that I know what it is, and I believe it's the only one left. Here's the crowd reception, January 16, 1953. The Waldorf car was known because it had hydraulic hood lifts and trunk lifts. Those are the Cylinders, they're not, they're not actually working in this picture, but they're, they're actually in the car. And Zora Arkis Duntoff attended the Motorama and saw the Corvette. Well, so much for the rumor that public demand caused it. Because on the very same day, Thomas Keating said this quote, the car's been named Corvette, plans for production are six months away. He said that when the show opened. So it really wasn't public demand. That actually, he boxed himself in. That really meant he had until the end of June to make good on it, and the press held him to it. This was the dinner that night, and there are all the, the big three at GM. There's Alfred P. Sloan, chairman, sitting on the left, standing as Harlow Curtis, who's the executive VP, acting GM president, and there's Charles Wilson, the ex-GM resigned president, who's going through his confirmation hearings. Now, this is interesting. This is January 17th. This is the front page of the Flint Journal. Senators delay Wilson decision. Oh, but then here comes all the photographs from the Motorama. You notice something? It's a day late. There was a 24-hour technological delay in getting photographs into a newspaper. Because you had to take the photographs, you had to develop them, then you had to make a copper plate, a printing plate. It took 24 hours. There's something as important as the Motorama was to Chevrolet in, in Flint, Michigan, which is their home, and it takes them 24 hours to get pictures in a paper. That's because it takes 24 hours. And there's nothing you can do to speed it up. There's the X-52, the Waldorf Corvette. There's Ed Cole at the wheel. The little thing underneath there in the bottom says, photos are courtesy of the Flint Journal. Their photographer was there taking them. Harold Jirasi, the Flint Journal auto editor's name is there, is writing this article. And there's a 24-hour delay. Why is that important? Well, you're going to see in a minute. Here's the other photos that went with it. Harley Earls of Sabre, Joe E. Brown, the comedian, sitting behind the wheel of the Corvette, Buick's Wildcat show car, a cutaway, and another note that Russell Scott took these pictures. He's another Flint Journal photographer. Stories, this is to show you that anytime there's something in the paper, it tells you who wrote it. 
If it's off the Associated Press line or the United Press line, it says it, just as both of those articles do. If it's written by a reporter, it tells you that. Okay, January 19th, here's the only known photo of that first engineering test car, the Opal, number 856. It was the third body, but the second car started. This is the day, January 19th, it's built and it's delivered to the GM proving ground. Only picture I've ever been able to find anywhere of that car. And it had a wooden grill in it. I should point out that grill was actually wood. Here's the plan now, so uh, 856 is the second one ever built and it's at the proving ground. And the third one being built is still at the Van Slyke plant. So those are the two secret Corvettes. This one here that got pulled ahead, these are the two cars that Bob Wilson saw. Another article in the Flint paper, uh, GM seeking answers on plastics. This is January 18th. It actually talks about Charles A. Chain, who's the vice president of research for GM. He calls fiberglass very promising for limited production and they're looking to hire engineers and experts, basically. Courtesy's big spurt in GM sales. This is January 19th. He's forecasting GM's gonna do $9 billion in sales in 1953. January 20th, they're still working on the Corvette. Here's the front of the cylinder block with the special machining that's only on the Corvette block. This is a special cylinder head. It didn't use a Chev normal Chevrolet cylinder head. It used a special one. This was a complete bill of material specific to the Chevrolet Corvette engine. It's the first time in Chevrolet's history that an engine is built specially for a vehicle. Prior to this, there's only one engine in Chevrolet, period. It's one engine, one part number, one bill of materials, and it goes in cars and trucks, and they're all manual transmissions because the power glide isn't even invented yet. Here's a crankshaft timing gear that was aluminum, and it's this gear that allowed the Corvette engine with the high lift cam to hit 5,000 RPM. Also, not heard of. Okay, Wolfram, as I said, was, a, was running the project. Well, he was asked to write a report dated January 19th. I'm not going to go into it a lot, but it's an epistle. It's the car's target at 3,150 pounds. They use the uniform parts classification code. Each page is specific. This one's talking about the frame. This page is talking about more about the frame and, and some of the uh, suspension settings. 52% weight on the front, 48 rear. Uh, this part's about the rear suspension. This is the brakes. This is a couple pages detailing everything that's special in the engine. And by the way, it was a Buick fan. So I really didn't bother doing a fan for the 53 quarter event. It was a Buick fan with a manual choke. Section six was more on the engine. Section seven was the transmission. Section eight was the fuel and exhaust, and he literally put in there, we have to have snarling dual mufflers for the Corvette. That's his words. Uh, steering, section nine. Wheels and tires. This is interesting. Right from the get-go, Bell Air hubcaps. Planned right from day one. So we can put Matt, that myth to bed. They weren't like, that, yeah, they were late because they weren't even thought of. And I love this section. Now this is, don't forget, this follows a standard format. This section says sheet metal, which there wasn't any, but he had to put it in there anyway to follow standard protocol. Then the electrical. Okay, what about the first ones wouldn't start because they didn't have ground wires? Well, right in here, it clearly says all body mounted items need a ground. So you can, that's a myth. Section 13 was a tool kit and a cooling. Okay, then we got the, a, a special cylinder case. Not much is changing here, except now Van Slyke is assembling the chassis for the car 854. This is the only known photo I could find of that second Corvette show car. It went on tour in Canada. Uh, this picture's taken in Toronto at the Expo Exposition Center. And it's, the, it's body number two of five, it's the second show job, and it's the second top secret Corvette that Bob talked about. And then Wilson was confirmed, and Curtis was named president of General Motors February 2nd. This is the water pump for the Corvette, so you can see time-wise here, they're, they're really getting down to the, the detail level of engineering the, the car. 
Now Ed Cole has to write a, a letter to Charlie Chain explaining what's new for 53 passenger cars, 54 passenger cars, and then he talks about the Corvette, and you can see all the detail that Ed Cole has to know himself in order to pull this off. And uh, right here it says that uh, one of the options was going to be wire wheels, uh, six volt system, a lot of special parts. They're already working on the V8. This is the core package. This is a U.S. patent for the 1955 V8 core package, which is why Chevrolet enjoyed 20 years before the competition could, uh, could do anything like it. They were working that far ahead. Here's the dual exhaust manifold. Uh, now, 854, the flint chassis is complete, but it's not going to be bodied. That's why it was crossed out earlier. Here's the high lift camshaft blueprint finished up April 25th. Here's the, the air cleaners for the 53. Uh, this picture's taken April 27, 1953. The two show cars are in the print of progress, you know, with all those super liners that went around the country. It was in, it was, it was coming into San Francisco to the convention center there and the GM photographers got it out and took this famous picture of it by the bridge. That's actually show car number one, EX52. We know where, we know where they went. The second car was in Denver, Colorado. The 856 is now being tested across the Belgian blocks and Fisher Body now has their chassis but they have no engine and no transmission. So, how did Zora get involved in all this? Well, he hired in May 1st. Uh, what was his relationship with Cole? Why was he banished to the, to the proving ground to work on truck brakes? Why was he almost fired for going to the 53 Le Mans race? Did he really invent fuel injection? And how come he didn't mesh well with his bosses? Well, Zora saw the Corvette the Motorama. He sent a letter to Ed Cole. Cole had Ollie interview him, and he hired him on the spot. And on May 1st, he started at Chevrolet reporting to Ollie. Another thing happened on May 4th though, Corvette is now approved for production. So this letter basically says, we're going to take all the work away from Paramount Engineering because the car is all done, and we're going to give each little piece to each little Chevrolet engineer. That was the plan. If you engineered hoods for the truck and the car, you're going to get the hood for the Corvette. Sounded like a great plan until 600 engineers revolted and refused to, well, they were just too busy. <laughs> they all stuck together. So Paramount really didn't, didn't get out of, the, out of the work. They still had some issues. The frame had some issues. The specs weren't up to date. They were talking about gel coating the bodies. Fiberglass dust was an issue. They were looking at, at spraying some metal coating on the inside of the firewall instead of the ignition shielding. They, need, they already knew the suspension wasn't good enough, for, so they were planning longer shocks. The side rails were too close together, the center of gravity the car didn't handle. They had squeaky springs, they needed ventilator. So anyway, they had a whole lot of problems already known as of May 4th. They also had an, an engine noise problem. They knew that they needed a duct between the carbs to stop the engine noise. Clearly says here 852 and 853 are show jobs. I don't know what 8 or 431 is, it got scrapped. It clearly says 854 is not going to have a body. And it says 856 is basically the only test car we're ever going to have. It's at the proving ground and it needs a new rear end already. This is the design check uh, car. 855 is going to be a design check car. Now they're talking about giving a frame to Oldsmobile too, but I don't think that ever happened. They're talking about a wire wheels RPO. And then comes the show schedule. This is why we know where car number one and car number two went. It's detailed in here where they are, everywhere they're going and they're talking about the start of production that's upcoming at Flint. And the last thing they want to do is once Flint, once Flint starts production, they're going to order three cars, one for proving ground, another one for proving ground, one for development, one for durability, and then one is an engineering demonstrator. So at this point, uh, car number one, the Waldorf is in Los Angeles. Car number two is in Detroit where they're doing publicity and the motion picture filming and Chevy Engineering is only going to have mm -hmm. chassis and motors for 854 and 855. And 855, they're putting a V8 in it already. That's why they're not going to put a body on it. They're co-engineering they're co the L6 in one of those and the V8 in the other. But now they've got to start making bodies. 
Now these pictures, when they were previously published, everybody thought this was the uh, Flint plant. No, this is at uh, the GM Tech Center in Detroit. It's on a big surface plate, and this is in May. Uh, there's a good film on it that, that uh, you can get that Steve Koss did to show how they did it. And this was Charlie Chain's pet project. There he is in the suit. He was personally overseeing this. He's a VP of research. Just so happened to be in the picture. There's the, there's the big Joe block. I guarantee you these panels were the finest that human beings could make with the known technology. You couldn't find better people or better die makers to make these panels. You also couldn't find more conscientious people with better tools to put them together. The problem was it just wasn't good enough, as you're going to see. It just plain wasn't good enough. Here's the show schedule for cars one and two, the two show cars. The first car, EX52, ends up in Dallas, where that picture bottom right was taken June 14th in Kansas City. Car number two, the second Motorama car, was EX53. It's at the Michigan State Fair and it ends on June 7th. And both cars are ordered back to Flint, Michigan for quote unquote rebuild into a production car. Return to Flint 614, return to Flint 67. Now, how are they going to do that? Well, here's the plan. We're not going to put a body, remember, on 854 and 855. So this letter says. We're not going to build cars 854 and 855. And you're going to take all the material, the complete set of materials you ordered, and you're going to dispose of the materials. Now, if you worked in GM for 40 years like Warren and I did, you know what the word dispose means. You also clearly know what the word scrap means, and it does not say scrap. Because if it had said scrap, you'd hit it with a hammer, destroy it, and throw it away. Now, one of the ways you can dispose later on, you can determine later to scrap it. But dispose is a very curious word for those of us that know inside. And it's written for a reason. So those two, all those things it takes to build those cars are being kitted. This is the paint instructions issued on June 2nd, 1953. What you're going to paint, there's another chart that goes with it that I'm not going to show here. It tells you how many ounces are allowed to paint a car with, believe it or not. Now Zora was on the job 30 days and he asked to go to Le Mans. Not going to happen. Ollie says no. He goes anyway. He says in his book, in his uh, biography that uh, Jerry Burton wrote, that, well, I wasn't planning on coming back to Chevrolet, but then they called him and they invited him back, but they gave him a whipping. And uh, that's how he got back. June 5th, Paramount Engineering is still in here. Uh, it turns out the first cars built all have three leaf rear springs. Now they realize they need a four leaf rear spring. So they've done a crash. The crash design is being started June 5th. Crash design for a four mount, and they want it done with parts by June 21st. This is plant 53. There's GMI Campus Center right up the road. Here's plant 53. This is not taken in 53, this is taken around 1980 something. And it's clearly a two story building, as you can see. And it was picked because it was out of sight and out of mind. So that's where the two cars go, and that's where the two kits to finish the cars are. And that legend is absolutely true. But you gotta be, you gotta be careful. They're the first two Corvettes ever built, but it's the first two Corvettes being rebuilt that happened. And then on June 16th, okay, remember those three purchase orders? They're now, the plant's getting close to starting, or so they think. So now they actually start ordering those three special cars, and they're given numbers that are assigned at the engineering center. So here's the purchase order for car number 3950, and notice the date that it's completed. They wanted it by June 30th down here at the bottom, but they actually get it June, July 7th, okay? And then they order car 3951. Same thing, they want it, this one they want July uh, 3rd, and it's completed July 7th. And then this is a letter saying what the status of the engineering test car is. 856 has now 3,000 miles on it after going across the Belgian blocks. 3,000 on the blocks, it is 78, 75 total, okay? And then, this is the picture we're all told is June 30th, right? Well, it turns out it wasn't. 
was actually staged on June 29th, which was a Monday. The cars were trucked in Sunday night. When the people came to work the next morning, they said, go get your picture taken with the Corvette. This is a blow up, of, this is a blow up, it's a section of that one where Tony Clyde was. Now if you believe, we just built two cars from scratch. You see those two things over Tony's head? Those are stacks of the trunk boards. There's two stacks with two wire bands on each one and none of the wire bands are broken. So if you just built two cars, where'd you get the trunk boards from? And what's behind them in the boxes are the trunk mats. None of them are disturbed. But that's just kind of circumstantial, right? Here's number two in the foreground, and there's no seat cushions in it. And there's no seat cushions in the one behind it, which is car number three. And I sent this article to John, or this picture, and some of this information to John Anbert, who owned that car at one time. And John said, you are full of it. You don't know what you're talking about. I got a three foot by four foot picture that the GM gave me. Hold on, I'm going to go get it. And he gets his magnifying glass out, and he gets back on the phone. And he goes, well, I'll be. He says, there's no seats in either one of them cars. You're absolutely, it's faked. Because the cars were dropped with seats. But you see, we're pretending to be building car number two. So we don't have, we're out of sequence. You see, they weren't even, it's like the mistakes people make in movies in Hollywood. You know, when people look for them. Well, they made those things here. Same thing with the headlight bezels. Okay, June 29th. See the daylight outside the window in the back of the plant? This isn't 6 o'clock in the morning. No way, it's not 6 o'clock in the morning. You don't get all executives in there at 6 o'clock anyway. <laughs> this picture was uh, taken with the uh, Forshee and Fezenden out in the parking lot. That is car number one. So you can tell by where the paper is, the invoice is, stuck on the windshield. This is the design check chassis. See, all this, all this build work was being done in this plant. So this is the design check chassis number 854. So that's why they photograph that. You see this number down here in the right hand corner? That's GM photographic. It turns out every single photo of what is supposed to be June 30th was taken by General Motors Photographic. There was no press at the plant either on Monday or on Tuesday, period, case closed. Nobody was invited, the Flint Journal wasn't even there. Here's the picture they took of the engine in car number three before that body's being lowered over it. Okay, still don't believe me? Here is the Flint Journal, June 30th, Tuesday morning, stamped in the upper right-hand corner on the microfilm, first edition, that hits the newsstands at 5.30 a.m. What time did night in the middle of the night you think they're printing those to be on the newsstand at 5.30 a.m.? And there's a picture of the Beecher High School next to it. It's not even news, it's just a picture of the Beecher High School. It turns out it's holding a place in that page. And the text is goofed up. The text says, quote, completed here today, a Chevrolet Corvette came off the line at assembly plant here, line at the assembly plant here. It's repeated. Actually, it had, even at 5.30, it couldn't have come off the line because the plant doesn't start till six, okay? But anyway, and there's no AP, no UP, and no author of this piece because Chevrolet marketing gave them the verbiage. Here's the second edition that hits the newsstand at 1030. Two things different. Substituted the official GM photographic picture and fixed the text. Completely staged, no photo credits. No authorship credits, because that's all put out there by Chevrolet in Flint to the Flint Journal, who does what they're told to do. So here we are, and then we're getting ready for a break now. This is a, a little bit of a summary, okay? The Waldorf car became VIN number one. The second show car became VIN number two. 856 test car has finished the Belgian blocks. Fisher body has the F car. All the trim parts have been disposed of for those two cars, and they've been disposed of on car number one and car number two over at plant 35. Chevrolet assembled five of the five 
chassis, they did that. Chevrolet provided one extra rolling frame only to Fisher Body. Fisher Body constructed four of the five planned fiberglass bodies. Chevrolet assembled three of the five planned opals. Styling borrowed two of the three completed opal Corvettes. Fisher Body has one planned opal minus the engine and transmission. Chevy ultimately ordered six sets of trim materials and used five and gave one of the sets to Fisher Body. So as we spool up number two, we gotta make a quick break. Let's do it.